Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. Today is the recording on. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I call this meeting to order a special meeting of the Isla Vista Community Services District Board of Directors uh, Saturday, November 18th, 12.06 p.m. Uh, Spencer, can you take roll? Director Bertrand. Present. Director Jordan. Present. Director Brandt. I'm here. Director Freeman. Here. Director Hedges. Director Geis. Director Thurlow. Okay, we have a quorum, four members here, and I'll announce that the meeting's being recorded. That's the only reason that we, we did that weird role thing. But we want to do inter introductions right now, if everyone wants to go around. Sure. Um, I'm Carlos. Um, I'm a member of the, I, I'm a director in the Isla Vista Recreation and Parks Board, but not speaking on behalf of that for today, and I've lived in IV for the last five years. Awesome. Hi, um, my name's Isha. I um, have recently been doing some work with Adopter Box, so I kind of came just to get a better understanding of um, like Isla Vista governance overall. Um, yeah. Awesome. My name is Jessica Alvarez Barbary. Um, I'm a student, and I'm very interested to hear what's going to be said here. Um, working with a sociology professor on an Eco Vista project, so we see how we can work together. Hi, I'm Gordon. I'm just trying to get more and more involved in my local community, so I'm excited for that. Hi, my name's Anthony. Um, I'm a member of the UCSB Senate this year. Um, I've been living at IB for, this is my second year now, so I've been so stuck with like internal school stuff and trying to get outside of that for a bit, so that's why I wanted to come out today. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Bacheva. I'm the External Vice President for Local Affairs in AS. I'm Lanny, and I am uh, uh, a lecturer at UCSB in Economics and on the board of the uh, Iowa Vista Community uh, Improvement. Which one is it? <laughs> Community Development Corporation, thank you. I'm UCDC, and uh, I first lived in Iowa in 1961. Uh, my name is Jacob LaBelle. I'm one of the directors of the Isla Vista Recreation and Park District with Carlos, but again, not representing them here today. Okay, um, I'm Emily Murray. I'm a student um, and I love a resident and also president of the campus benefits. And uh, one person we miss. Oh, I'm Eric. I'm just I'm from the Daily Nexus. I'm just here. Also, cool. Great to meet you. Thanks for being here and feel free to come closer if you oh, like. Oh, really? Okay, thank you. Sorry. I was, <laughs> I was wondering if the table was just full. Yeah, if you want to just pull up the chair. <laughs> Pretty good. I won't get to see you. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Without further ado, we're going to get started with just a brief presentation to kind of frame our discussion, and then we'll dive right in. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, so much. Um, so my name is Spencer Brandt. I'm a third-year student at UCSB. Uh, I'm also the secretary of the board and a director on the Isla Vista Community Services District. So glad to see you all here. We'll dive right in. My computer will allow it. All right. So what is the IVCSD? I think a lot of you are probably pretty familiar. Uh, we are a local government um, that's called Community Services District. Um, we're a special district that is chartered by California law. Um, we have a number of powers, things we can do. We can contract for police protection services for the community. Um, we can provide tenant landlord mediation services. We can provide parking restrictions and regulations. We can manage community facilities. We can construct and maintain uh, street space, streetscapes, meaning uh, sidewalks, um, lighting, um, gutters, trees, things like that. Um, we can uh, provide graffiti abatement, and we can fund a municipal advisory council and an area planning commission, uh, which are two um, different sort of units of government that are advisory in nature. Um, some more background. So. Um, how we got here. Um, Assembly Bill 3 is um, a bill that passed the state legislature in, in 2015. Um, it was written um, sort of by the community in this room right here. Um, over the course of about two years, um, the community uh, held regular meetings, um, a lot, largely in response to everything that had been happening in uh, 2014. and. Um, a lot of the uh, unrest that had occurred, um, whether we're talking about the Deltopia riots, uh, whether we're talking about um, the May 23rd tragedy, and said, um, what can we do to prevent these things from happening again? What can we do to uh, prevent this sort of lack of attention that has characterized Isla Vista from um, different stakeholders that have been involved in here at the governmental um, and university level, and try to um, 
channel the energy that is here right now to make some improvements into something that's lasting. And out of that um, came this idea for a community services district. Assembly Bill 3, um, after it passed and was signed into law, authorized our in eight initial services. Um, the eight initial services that we are authorized to do uh, are specific to us, and many of them are services that uh, other community services districts uh, provide. Um, many of them, or a couple of them, are services that only we are authorized to provide. The bill sort of was custom made for the community needs at the time. So out of that, um, part of the formation process um, was that the uh, community services district did not follow the regular um, process by which uh, we would create a local government. Uh, it sort of sidestepped that process and sidestepped um, this thing called the Local Agency Formation Commission, which usually has the say on those things. But there were a couple of areas where the Local Agency Formation Commission did have uh, a say over um, what was going to be put forward to the voters, because um, in California, and what AB3 stipulated, uh, both the creation of the district and um, our funding mechanism did need to be funded, or did need to be voted on by the voters. Um, so Measure E 2016 uh, was placed on the ballot uh, by LAFCO and the County Board of Supervisors. Um, it uh, is the ballot question right here. It's a very simple question. Uh, shall the formation of the Island District Community Services District pursuant to Government Code uh, Section 61250 uh, be approved? And um, these are the results right here of what we saw in 2016. Um, around 5,600 people in Isla Vista uh, went out and voted yes for that, and around 834 voted no. Um, measure F uh, was the utility user tax. Um, the CSD is authorized to levy a utility user tax, um, as sort of uh, came up with by the community. Uh, we're the only district in all of California that is authorized to levy a utility user tax. And we are also required to authorize a utility user tax if we want to stick around. Um, in, uh, in 2016, um, the, the process to put this on the ballot went, again, sort of sidestepping through LAFCO, but did give LAFCO one uh, important thing, which is that uh, they had a, a ceiling and a floor for how low and high they could set the percentage rate of the utility user tax, uh, which to back up a little bit, utility user tax just means it's basically a percentage tax of the total charge of the utilities of gas, water, uh, electric, sewage, uh, and garbage disposal services. So um, many of us, I think, probably are familiar with gas through SoCal Gas, water uh, through the Goleta Water District, electricity through Southern California Edison. Um, sewage, maybe through the uh, Goleta Sanitary District, um, and garbage disposal services. Um, that's something that sort of the, the county picks up um, through a different sort of a contract. So some of these are things that you would see um, and that you pay. Different landlords um, in Isla Vista, if you are a renter, um, pick up certain utilities. Some of them don't pick up any of them. Um, some of them uh, provide all of them, and it's part of sort of what your rent is. Um, if you are a homeowner, then you're, pro you're definitely familiar with all of these um, bills, and um, this, is, uh, this is how it would go. So um, right here are the results uh, from how things went in 2016. Um, I have highlighted at the top that the tax requires two-thirds plus one. That is per California law. Um, there were around 4,000 voters who voted yes on this measure and around 2,500 who voted no. So since then, uh, we've been in this interesting situation where the district has been created, but we have not been uh, funded by a dedicated revenue source. Um, nevertheless, we began operating on March 1st of 2017 uh, when we first came into being. Uh, at our first meeting, we elected a president, a vice president, and a secretary. Uh, since then, we've leased office space from the county um, right next door um, and got that up and running. We've assumed management of the community room, which is this room that you're sitting in here now, um, and uh, it is available for booking, I will say as a little bit of a plug, if you have a, a group that wants to meet, um, and that is free of cost. Um, we've secured around $23,000 in grants uh, for various uh, community programming and improvements to this room. 
Uh, we created the Safety Station CSO program in partnership with UCPD, uh, which utilizes um, non-sworn officers, the CSOs, um, stations them over uh, right now at Little Acorn Park uh, on Friday and Saturday nights um, for folks who uh, don't quite feel safe making the trek home themselves. They can um, go ahead and uh, ask a CSO and the CSO will escort them there. Um, we successfully advocated to save 11 public safety personnel positions from budget cuts during the um, County of Santa Barbara's uh, budget process. Uh, Isla Vista Foot Patrol was going to be hit very hard um, during those cuts. Uh, we were really out front to take a position on it and um, working in partnership with our county supervisor, we were able to save those positions. And for um, the record, we'll announce that Director Hedges came in at 12 16. Go ahead. Interrupting the entire process. <laughs> Sorry about that. You're good. It's okay. Um, the, the last thing is that we've created the UCSB Public Policy Internship Program. It gives UCSB students um, paid internships in our local government. Current projects. Um, folks on the board are working on developing landlord tenant mediation services, uh, and that is uh, someone in partnership, um, my understanding, with associated students. Um, we are creating the process to distribute uh, the community program funds um, that we've received through uh, much of our programming grants um, to different community groups, student organizations, et cetera. Um, also working with law enforcement stakeholders uh, to further engage the community. So uh, myself. Spencer, uh, could you go back one? Yes. Yeah, could you say the current project again? The second one is what you go. Uh, creating a process to distribute community program funds to community groups, student organizations, etc. So uh, one of the grants that we received um, through the Bauer Foundation um, has a large number, of, uh, a large amount of funds available for programming of different sorts. And so the thought was that uh, for different organizations that are in the community that sort of have programming that they want to run, um, we could be a funding source, a portion of that grant money could be um, ended up being distributed to them, to the folks who are already doing the work, instead of trying to sort of create our own thing. Is that part of the 23000 or is that an initiative? That is, that is part of the 23000 yes. And one of the things that I'll mention that was not on here in terms of uh, district progress is that the 23000 is not uh, our only funding. We also have uh, a commitment from UC Santa Barbara to fund us uh, for $200,000 um, each year for seven years. Um, this year, uh, we have, I believe, gotten about, what is it, around 60 to 70,000 of that that has been spent. Um, committed. Or, or committed to be spent. Um, a lot of that money uh, cannot be spent on sort of the operational side of uh, local government. And that um, has presented a number of challenges to us um, throughout uh, the first couple of months of operation. And Spencer, I, as a, I, I presume you want some though. Oh, of course. It, the, the, um, when you say that they cannot be spent on uh, the 200000 a year from UCSB, that's a decision of UCSB. In other words, that's not any condition. If UCSB says we prefer to have those funds spent on that, they could do that. When we've been on the process of negotiation, and I think probably President Burke tried yeah, to better see I can see on that. Is. So um, we've had a very collaborative process with UCSB as far as um, the commitment that we have is for mutually agreed upon services and programs and projects. And what that has been thus far is uh, for public safety, our Isle Vista Safety Station mm -hmm. program. Um, also providing us funding for um, our office space as far as for the purpose of getting us off the ground and providing the internship program for UCSB students. Um, so with that, we've received um, about 70,000 thus far. But with that remaining 130,000 for this first year, that'll all be um, really service-based. So looking into tenant mediation, looking into further public safety programs, um, community programming and facilities operations, which we'll get into some more. but. The process has been very collaborative thus far, and um, it's been about identifying areas of mutual interest, um, and we've, we've had great success with that. And Father John's been in on those discussions, as well as George Thurlow, as well. Yeah. Um, I have a question. When you say mutual interest, does that mean like between UCSB students, kind of only, and Isla Vista, or have you noticed that that grant money also 
like their they approve of it going toward broader community things as well. So none of it goes. Um, so it's for it's to be spent for the whole community. Um, mm -hmm. Is we're we're not an extension of the university, but um, with those uh, that negotiations that I'm describing, it's with um, the chancellor's office and the community services district on behalf of the residents of Bella Vista. For example, with the two services we have right now, the CSO safety station, the CSOs are not just available to UCSB students; they're available to all. And then this room, of course, is a public space; is available to anyone as well. So with that, I'll, I'll continue on a little bit. Um, the Utility User Tax Ad Hoc Committee was a committee that the Board of Directors formed. Um, myself, Ethan, and Father John uh, make up the committee. Um, the Board of Directors identified the need to pursue a utility user tax because of the lack of unrestricted revenue um, that's created difficulties for administration and operation. Um, right now, um, in our current state of uh, sort of the administrative side of the district, which is sort of the boring, not fun side of the district, but nonetheless very important to um, our operational things. Um, we currently are spending around $4,000 um, to retain one staff person. Um, that is not something that is sustainable, um, and this arrangement that we have um, is something that uh, we are very excited to have gotten into place. Uh, however, because it, it is only a one-year contract and uh, is meant to uh, sort of get us off the ground in the beginning during the startup phase. Um, the other uh, need that the board identified was that uh, Government Code 61250C3 mandates that the district be dissolved in 2023 if a utility user tax is not levied. And so uh, this has sort of put a little bit of a sense of urgency in all of our minds um, to be able to get one of these on the ballot and convince the community that um, you know, this is uh, something that is worthwhile and having the district is something that is worthwhile. Um, I went over this a little bit, but what is a utility user tax? It's a percentage-based charge based on the consumption of utility services. It's a special tax, which m means that um, in addition to the two-thirds approval for passage, it has to be levied for specific purposes. Um, and so the specific purposes that I talked about before, uh, the eight services that we can provide, are the specific services that Measure F was, uh, was, was on the ballot for. Um, the services that um, you know, we choose going forward um, can be, uh, that's something that we have flexibility in, but the committee thus far has favored sort of a broad approach so that we can um, make sure that the revenue is, um, like, you know, uh, can be responded to different needs that come up in the community. It isn't just pigeonholed into one specific thing. Um, the CSD has the legal authority to levy the UT on natural gas, water, garbage, sewage, sanitation, and electricity. Um, the things that the committee is going to be rec making recommendations on are the title and the ballot question, um, the resolution uh, and the ordinance to the Board of Supervisors requesting an election, the date of the election, and also the tax rate. And so the ballot title in question has to be 75 words or less. Um, it has to be followed by the words yes and no. It spells out what the revenue will be used for. And so Part of our motivation as the committee for wanting to get folks in the community together, gather input through both this event and through the survey drive that we're going to be launching, is to try to figure out what the services are that people are most excited about and people want to see us most pursue, what some of the issues are in the community that um, people think are most pressing and that we can um, make a dent in. And so um, through that, uh, we would be able to take um, the things that people most care about and put them directly into the ballot question. Uh, the example is the ballot question that we had uh, for Measure F last time. Uh, if it looks a little confusing to you, um, then you would be in agreement with the ad hoc committee. Um, we have uh, reviewed it and, and found that the current sort of wording of it um, was uh, not put together sort of by anyone affiliated with the district. It was put together by the county council and uh, sort of uh, was a response to some of the weird uh, legalistic quirks. So it, it may seem a little confusing if the Isla Vista Community Services District is formed. Shall a utility user tax be imposed, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, we're hoping to uh, rework that and uh, come up with something that um, is a little more uh, straightforward and transparent with the voters to what uh, the ballot measure would be trying to do. 
Uh, the resolution in the ordinance is just a resolution requesting that the Board of Supervisors hold a special election or consolidate with an existing scheduled election. We'll talk a little bit about timing in a moment. Um, the committee has some thoughts on that as well. Um, the date of the election options are either a special election, the gubernatorial primary election, or the gubernatorial general election. These are the ones that are happening in the near future. And so in all of our discussions, um, one of the things that the committee has identified is that um, sort of when the, when the district, you know, being that we are a local government and that interest in local governments definitely fluctuates, but the services that we render nevertheless impact uh, the community, it's easier to tell our story um, to the community uh, through uh, a, both a campaign and through a um, election um, when, you know, there are less things on the ballot for us to compete with when um, we don't have uh, you know, a, a historic presidential election that is uh, sort of taking away a lot of the um, attention that otherwise would have been uh, on this, so that uh, voters can focus on the question that is before them. Um, and so um, we have definitely been uh, looking towards a, the gubernatorial primary election on June 5th um, as a possible option. And right now, with all of the work that we have done, we are uh, completely on track to be able to do that if that is what the community is most interested in. Um, for rate options, um, we have to set the tax rate on each utility. Uh, variance between the utilities is okay. Uh, that wasn't what was pursued in the past. Um, the committee uh, has talked a little bit about this, but doesn't really have, I think, uh, a strong argument for why the utilities should be varied. Um, we have a, a five, the 5% 5 minimum and 8% maximum on the rate um, that was applied to LAFCO does not apply to the Board of Directors. And so uh, theoretically, if uh, the committee uh, wanted to recommend a higher or lower tax uh, than this is the 5% and the 8%, we could do that. Um, the 5% and the 8% um, taxes were, have both um, been, they both been sort of plotted out in terms of uh, what the 5% and the 8% could allow for in the IBCSD plan for service that was submitted to LAFCO. And so um, those are the main things that we've looked at thus far um, with definitely uh, more interest in uh, being able to provide more services through more revenue in response to the community demand for so. Um, so the service priority survey, oh, I think this is the wrong PowerPoint that I have plugged up, but that is okay. So that's, pre that's pretty much the conclusion of this presentation about what the ad hoc committee has been doing. Um, I'd love to hear any other questions that you have before we sort of dive into the survey. Um, it's been really great working uh, with these three, and I think we've had a lot of great conversations, a lot of possibilities, and uh, a lot of, I think, uh, good things to come in terms of what we can do to get uh, more dedicated funding sources to our community. Um, one of the things that um, has been talked about a lot in terms of sort of the 30,000 feet level just about Isla Vista is that um, a lot of folks identify that there's something sort of like the cycle of neglect that happens in Isla Vista. Um, something tragic will happen, um, tensions will boil over, and um, you know, something, people will get hurt. And then uh, everyone sort of in the community puts a lot of attention into, well, what are we gonna do to, to solve IV? What are we gonna do to make sure that people can be safe when they uh, are trying to go to school or go to their job without their lives? Uh, what are we gonna do to make this community livable? And then as time goes on, sort of the interest in that project sort of wanes as, um, you know, just working with people that's difficult or um, interests don't align and um, then it goes down to zero and things start getting bad again. And it's just sort of this up and down cycle. Uh, one of the things that we really, um, I think the community all agreed was good about um, establishing an institution is that uh, when you have an institution, it sort of acts, it, it both has the memory and it has the ability to provide resources um, into the future and to respond to these issues in a much quicker and more focused way um, than maybe other uh, stakeholders in the community can. So um, that's my little two cents, my editorial. Um, with that, Ethan, if you yeah. have anything to add. And I kind of want to frame what our intention is with this kickoff um, for the public input process for a revenue measure. 
And that really is, we have this excellent opportunity to provide these eight services, these eight initial services that the community demanded and uh, the state granted to us. And while we've made really good progress over the past, I guess, nine months, roughly, um, our hands are somewhat tied and as far as preventing us from reaching our full potential and for full service level until we do pass this tax. And the last time that we did go to the voters, um, we, we had a lot of success. We didn't have quite enough, <coughs> but there was a lot of momentum. And I'm really excited for us to, to present um, this option to the voters coming up, but more excited about the community input and the um, as far as what, what desires the community has for services. Thus far, we've really been able to move on public safety and downtown and mediation, but I think this is an excellent opportunity for us to look at our other services as well and see what can we do um, to best serve Isla Vista, what can we do to best improve the quality of life. And I think now if we want to go through the survey briefly and then get into the sure, discussion. Sure, I will pull it up right now. So this survey that we have is, um, been distributed this week um, through a uni university announcement as well as um, announced at various different events. And what this is, is it walks through um, the different areas of service that we have and tries to prioritize what people would like to see us spending money on. I'm not seeing here. I'm going to take a look for this in my email inbox. Can I make a brief statement? I've often been called into communities that have been impacted by uh, crisis, trauma, violence, and so forth. Um, and uh, and I've, I've observed how many of those communities have attempted to restore that sort of homeostasis of peace that we all really want. We all really want to have a sense that we're in a safe and secure community. And when that, that world gets rocked, like it has so often in Isla Vista, uh, in the decades that I've been here, I've seen it happen all too many times. Uh, when it happens, we begin to ask those questions. We don't that much in between. And uh, one of the unfortunate things about the last ballot was that it basically said, uh, would you like to have a community service district, and then would you like to have a tax, was kind of what the, the second measure was. Uh, it wasn't so much that it outlined what the benefits of it might be, what the uh, uh, what this might mean for you as individual citizens. And so now we're, we're, we're kind of revisiting that process to a certain extent to find from the citizens of this community what is it that you really desire. And um, wherever I've been where there's been crisis and trauma, we want that sense of safety at the front end. And that's why we have really front-loaded that question here in what we're doing. And, um, but those kinds of things, we have this great <coughs> American motto, live free or die. Well, you know, you don't live for free. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, and, and the, the freedom that you so desire and the safety that you so desire does cost. And uh, the question becomes, how do, we, how do we provide that? That which has not been very well provided for us in the past. Uh, to paraphrase Jackson Brown, uh, old people look among you, it's there, your hopes must lie. And so that's why we are looking to one another to, to chart that course together. And I am just, as, as a, an old long-term resident, I am so excited to see that process beginning with strength. And, uh, thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Ready? Yeah. So with that, uh, I'll actually zoom in a little bit. Yes. Um, so just to clarify, so the, so I remember these issues being pushed out when it was like when this tax was being publicized and whatnot and being pushed throughout IV. But just to be clear, I don't remember the ballot clearly. It was a few years ago. But um, so none of these none of these issues were listed on the actual ballot. So uh, if, if I, I can go back <coughs> and pull this up for that a moment. Was. So that this this language right here. Um, shall the formation of Isla Vista Community Service District be ordered. That was the language that was on the ballot. This is exactly what you saw with this ballot title, the title in that question. And then the same thing goes for uh, Metro F, with the exception of the two-thirds thing. I just threw that on there. So there was no mention of improving safety, yeah, uh, yeah. tenant mediation, yeah. public yeah. facilities. 
It's going to cost, but we're not going to tell you what the benefits of the cost are going to be. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. essentially what that does. Yeah. And so um, when that happened, I know I think a lot of us just personally were a little dissatisfied with that. Uh, but nevertheless, sort of that's you know what it doesn't matter. We still got to go out and make the case to everybody. And so, um, like I emphasized, we were not the ones that had any sort of mechanism to write this question. It was prepared through uh, county council. Um, and uh, we're, we're hoping to have our own council assist us in preparing the current question. Yes, Jim. Um, so uh, two quick things I, I want to, one, one thing I think is just worth, worth noting as, as we have this discussion is that we had those, the eight powers that were mentioned, um, but uh, we have an opportunity as we go back and, and now um, set up the special tax in order to potentially talk about different services. So if there's something that you guys are particularly excited about, please bring it up and, uh, and, and see if we can figure out if it's compatible with the CSD law and we can try to figure out if it's compatible with um, And then in addition, I just want to verify for sure, I'm pretty certain I understand, but um, we aren't going to have to go back to LAFCO, right? Correct. For um, if we don't change services, if we do stay within our current service allotment, correct. we will be able to just do this. That's correct. Awesome. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be burdensome. Yeah. Okay. So this is the Better ID for You and Me survey. If you haven't had a chance to look at it, you can pull it up on your phone by just going to tinyurl.com/betterid. I can even put that right in here. <clears throat> I can wait for uh, folks who want to pull it up to pull it up. Um, but um, this survey, I'll uh, just give a little bit of background. Um, it was launched a number of days ago, um, both through a university announcement and um, on district social media. Um, on top of that, in the coming uh, weeks and days, um, we are going to be uh, beginning uh, the process of canvassing uh, Isla Vista residents uh, and having them, um, if folks who are interested, fill this out um, and uh, collecting that data by going to people where they live. Because one of the things I mentioned earlier on is that uh, just because uh, not everyone in Isla Vista knows every single thing tit for tat that the community services district is doing or that the county or that the university is doing, the things that uh, we s still decide on and the services we provide still are things that they utilize and still are things that um, they uh, that they should care about and so um, and that they have opinions on. So um, in the survey, it collects um, some data: your name, your email, uh, whether or not you want to sign up for regular updates from the CSD. Uh, we promise you want to use that privilege, so I, I would check yes if I were you. Um, how long have you lived in Isla Vista? Um, with a number of different options, um, scaling all the way to 20 plus. Um, how would you describe yourself? Um, a UCSB student, a SBCC student, a long-term homeowner, a long-term renter, um, a long-term renter who's a, a part of a family, uh, a recent college graduate, business owner, uh, landlord or property owner, uh, or a folk, someone who's houseless. And um, going on from that, um, does I love this to have sufficient resources to ensure uh, a high quality of life for residents? There are three options. Hey, Spencer? Yes. I, I, just want to say, I think it's really biased when you put no rather than yes as the first response. Because when I see that, irrespective of the question, since it's always yes, no, what I presume is that the person who's doing the poll is trying to get a no answer rather than a yes answer. And so that I think it reduces the legitimacy of the poll. It just looks like it's biased. So well, I, I can assure you that was not our intention, but I can also assure you that we can get that changed. That's a mistake, as so far as I can tell. You and so we'll switch the two. The um, I'm not sure if Google Forms allows us to do that, but we can look into it. And I actually think that that may be a glitch, because I just clicked on the link, and for that question on my machine, it comes up first, don't know, yeah, then my, yes, my and then no. Know. And you got the same one there. Yeah, don't know first, yeah. And I got no, don't know, yes, so I guess it already is randomized. I, I okay. think there Google you go. Forms <laughs> is randomizing. You, 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 you don't want it to look like you're looking for an answer in terms of, right. because people do check, are disproportionately likely to check the first answer. I have a question too, because I noticed that the ballot language is in the affirmative. Like, do you approve? Uh, I just kind of had a question other than, or like, a, 
just the way that the question itself is phrased. I, I, I was so sort of wondering if that's I'll, like a, a I'll, I'll stop you because uh, I'm happy to hear your question, but I just wanted to clarify the ballot language is the previous ballot language and not the one that we're considering. Oh, I know that. Okay. But I was just kind of wondering if that's just uh, the standard of how uh, the language is written. Is. Okay, because I, I just... That would be a great question for Ross. Okay, thank you. For people who don't know, Ross is our um, legal counsel. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we can definitely look into that because yeah, we, we don't want to have the impression that the survey is slanted in one way or another. Um, then there's also a way for you to elaborate sort of what are some of the common challenges that you face in Lionel Vista through uh, sort of a written answer. Uh, we wanted to have sort of uh, answers to be able to qualify our quantitative uh, side of the survey. Um, you can select your top three priorities for Isla Vista service improvements. And um, these uh, services here are directly things that the community services district in particular under current law would be able to do. Um, uh, things to affect the public safety, um, things pertaining to infrastructure and lighting, uh, oversight over the planning and development process of new buildings, um, tenant landlord mediation services, um, infrastructure things to sidewalks, um, parking, community facilities and programming, and uh, enhanced representation and graffiti abatement slash public art. So with that, I guess I have to fill it out in order to get to the next page. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do that. <laughs> Is there an option to remain anonymous on this survey? You know, it doesn't look like it, but we can look into that. I was just wondering, because maybe I, I would be like a little bit more honest if, I don't know. I doubt that it actually verifies I'm not this kind of girl. Right, right. So. <laughs> yeah, there definitely is not verification, so if you just want to put, I don't know, MattyJ at baseball.com, some made up email, you could. But we can look into that as well. That's exactly what my email is. <laughs> I literally just said the, the first couple words that came in my mind. <laughs> So we can go over to the next page. <coughs> so now we get into more specific Isla Vista issues, um, such as um, how has your experience been renting from Isla Vista landlords and property owners? Can you give an example of a positive or negative experience? Um, in addition to that, how often do you feel safe in Isla Vista? What have you found lacking in terms of public safety? How often do you or your customers struggle to find parking near your home or business? How do you think parking can be improved in Isla Vista? Do you notice graffiti around Isla Vista? What kind of public art would you like to see in our community? What sort of improvements can help beautify Isla Vista? Have you experienced a lack of community space, cultural events, and access to social services? Describe what, would, what you would like to see more of in these areas in Isla Vista. Do you think Isla Vista is well or underlit? Where are where can lighting be improved? What other infrastructural needs exist in Isla Vista? Do you think property and land development should occur more or less frequently? And if so, what kind do you support? Have there been decisions made about Isla Vista that you felt voiceless on? Give us an example and how you think the decision would have been better with local involvement. What are your favorite parts about Isla Vista? How can they be supported or improved to be even better? If you could change anything about Isla Vista, what would it be and in what way? And then uh, just how did you hear about this survey? Um, and so I know I started just ran through all that at once just to do a little bit of an overview. Um, but that's sort of what the survey contains. You are not required to fill it out now at all, um, but we wanted to give sort of an overview of what was on it. Um, I was thinking, one of the things we could do, aside from opening it, opening it up to sort of talk about some of these questions and have a discussion with you all, um, is just go around um, the room and, and hear sort of what thing you're most excited to give your feedback on as a part of this survey, because there are a number of different things, um, but I'd love to hear sort of what part of the uh, survey interests you the most, or you because sometimes you know you fill out these surveys and you think you know well these questions don't matter but oh yeah this one you know this is the thing I've been trying to tell them. But beyond the survey, perhaps more just which one of our services are you most? And maybe if you want to pull up that one of those beginning slides from the slideshow that outlines what we can do. <coughs> yes. If I can find. It. Yeah. 
So there we are. So uh, we'd, we'd love to open it up for that. If there's a service that you're interested in, if there's something that you're excited in um, uh, letting us know about through the survey process, we'd, we'd love to hear it. I, I think the two things that I'm most excited about are the Municipal Advisory Council. I'd really like to see that happening and much more active. Um, just, I, I think there's a lot of things that that is really the best means of discussing as a community. Um, and then kind of the other thing I'm, I'm interested in is parking restrictions. And I, I mean not creating more, but actually trying to lift some. Um, I'm living at Garden Court right now, and finding parking there can be, like a, around there can be really, really difficult. Um, and I would really like to see like along um, uh, Camino Corto, um, especially along the open spaces, if we could be making that able for people to park and starting to look at um, perhaps along El Colegio, I feel like there's a lot of parking spots that we could open up and that, that would be a big noticeable change for, for many people who don't normally come out to these things. And it would be showing um, like tangible improvements that um, I don't know, it's, it, it don't just require funding, but require people organizing and advocating. And, um, and, and also I think it'd be really cool if kind of through that we could come up with a, a system w for the county um, where we could, um, I don't know, have the ability to say block off Del Playa to cars on like a Friday or Saturday night for an event. Um, those are. Those are my big interests. It's kind of a lot. But on, on the parking side, I guess you'd say create more street side parking. Yeah, that I, I feel like there are a lot of s spots. Um, like I, I don't believe there's a good reason why we don't have parking along El Colegio, or uh, oh, uh, especially Camino Corto, but for much of El Colegio as well. Lenny, you've been very involved with the community center, and that's sure. coming online soon. Want to talk on that a little bit? Yeah, I, 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 I think that trying to develop a community center in the heart of Isla Vista is something that's really important. And um, if you want to have more of a downtown area and more of a downtown feel on Friday and Saturday nights, it seems to me that um, its development is something that's really important. And I would say that going along with that is, is two other things. One is the street art, because part of the discussions in the past have been that there could be some street murals and things like that in the vicinity of the community center that I think would make it more of a hub. And then also, I think that the issue of uh, alcohol licenses in Isla Vista, I know there's a discussion on this the other night, is that I didn't have a chance to stay for it. But the, uh, um, you know, from, from my standpoint, uh, it would make sense to have more, it's better for people to stay in Isla Vista than to have to go downtown, and uh, if Isla Vista is going to increase municipal organization in the future, it needs to have more sales tax revenue uh, circumstances. So I see the community center and more community art and a business district is all integrally uh, connected. I'm personally very passionate about the development end, so the Area Planning Commission. Um, and if we could develop some kind of process to kind of court developers that we actually feel understand the culture of Isla Vista, are not trying to gentrify Isla Vista. Um, I'm also very concerned about our houseless community and the way that you know there's been some, some challenges there with space um, and interaction with our police force. Um, so just Again, gentrification is something very much on my mind when we're talking about development. Awesome. And real quick, could you tell us more about the Eco Vista yes. that you mentioned just in brief? Yeah, I don't want to take up too much space on that. Um, I'd love to have a further conversation about it, but um, I'm working with a team of students um, and Professor John Foran in our sociology department. And uh, the project has been incubating for some time now, and it's basically if we could envision Isla Vista as a totally environmentally friendly, and just community, how could we do it, and how could students help lead the charge on that? Um, and again, so how can we create economic opportunities, how can we incentivize people to maybe 
not bring cars to Ivy, um, kind of approaching it creatively and not having to go through the county as much as possible because there's wonderful collaborative opportunities, but then things also get dragged out, in my opinion, going that route as well. Um, so we're building a website right now where we were actually, um, the reason I'm here is we were actually putting together a survey just like this oh, cool. um, with a team of students and we were planning on doing door to door outreach. So I would love to like, yeah, see what the results of this survey are and see if that can help inform our projects moving forward. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing. Cool. That's awesome. And then, um, so this past week, and one thing that I haven't even been able to, the board hasn't altered yet, but um, myself and uh, Jonathan Abud, our general manager, met with Deanna and um, Daniel from IVTU, um, along with um, Aaron Jones from AS, and we uh, spoke about tenant mediation further, and, uh, and Natalie was uh, there as well on the phone. And we uh, were able to, I think, really make some good progress as far as collaboration between our two organizations. And uh, I feel that tenant mediation is something that we already have um, funding for, given that it's a priority of the university and a priority of our board. But um, nonetheless, more resources will help us be more effective in that. Do you have anything to add on our? Not specifically, no, but uh, IBT has been working for uh, over many years, and certainly over the last year, on developing a uh, tenant mediation program, really building off of all the conversations that we've all been having. And so uh, there's been a lot of um, researching about the right company uh, or agency to work with to do it. And so we've been involved in that conversation and now getting a chance to talk with the IBCSD about what that collaboration could look like. So it's really exciting to think about all the possibilities around tenants' rights work right now moving forward in the community. And um, one more thing, so obviously we have our, our Isla Vista Safety Station program up and running um, by expanding the CSO program, but I'm curious if anyone has any other specific public safety programming ideas that they have been thinking about that they'd like to see us work on. Michael. Um, what role could the CSD play in possible creation of an oversight board? I, I, I know a lot of people in Isla Vista, and this isn't so much my personal experience, but I know a lot of people in Isla Vista feel as though the foot patrol is in an alpha predator role. And we citizenry actually pay for that service, and structurally it makes no sense that the citizenry isn't in, that doesn't have a direct supervisory role in relation to the foot patrol. Um, so that's that's the question I have with respect to public safety. Sure. And, and also, also, more importantly, um, how can we engender a culture of self responsibility so that the foot patrol doesn't have to get so many calls for service? The people aren't, aren't so pressed by uh, the pressures of modern life and um, the pressures of the university to act out. Absolutely. And one of the reasons that we, uh, I guess one of the, the side reasons that we got the power to contract for additional police protection services was not just to increase the public safety services that are offered, but then also to bring Isla Vista representatives to the table with law enforcement. Um, since we are contracting directly for their services. And as far as oversight goes for this agency, it's on the services that we contract for. Um, but nonetheless, I think there's been conversations going on, which Spencer can speak about, about having the IVCSD um, being one seat out at the table out of many of Isla Vista stakeholders um, having greater collaboration with law enforcement. Yeah, so um, that is something that I've been, I've actually had a number of different people in the community from a number of different, I think, constituencies who have come to me and said, you know, um, we want to do something that sort of looks like the police collaborative board. And so I've been working with them. Uh, we don't have anything to present yet, but I think we've had some really good discussions about what that might look like. <coughs> um, one of the things that I always make sure to tell people is that if you're dissatisfied with one of the things, you know, a practice of the police or something that is going on that um, they're doing, because occasionally it does come up, 
Um, the, the number one, one of the reasons that we got created as a district was to provide more local oversight. And uh, part of that local oversight um, in the future could come from things like um, taking over the contracts of um, different agencies that are currently providing services. So um, in that sort of realm of possibility, because I, I, people talk to me all the time, you know, well, what are we going to do about you know this thing that's going on, or this agency is doing this, and you know I don't necessarily agree with it. And um, unfortunately, a lot of the times I have to say, you know, we can advocate for it, but we don't have the power in the situation because we don't have the leverage, we don't have the money for that. And so um, that sort of I think brings it back full circle to what we're trying to do here is to try to. Uh, it, it's not just funding for the services, and it's not just funding for. Um, you know, the Municipal Advisory Council or Tenant Landlord Mediation Services, but it's more leverage for the community to be able to affect the change that we want to see. And, you know, maybe because a lot of people will tell me things like, you know, well, I think the things that you guys are doing are great, but, you know, what about this other thing that's going on here? So, let's see. And so that's sort of, I guess, um, I don't know if it completely answers your question, but we can certainly talk afterwards sort of about what you'd be interested in seeing and dive deeper into the specifics of, of something like that. I think it's interesting to look at the framing, um, oversight, uh, collaboration, accountability. They produce different um, tones, much, much different tones. Um, and so maybe we could look, strive for a mix of, uh, of all of those. Okay. Um, the, uh, I, I've often heard this actually around the country in other communities that are working on uh, similar interactions between law enforcement and community. Um, uh, what I have heard is that the stronger the community is, the safer the community will become. Um, it, it's, uh, it seems counterintuitive to think of the building of a community center, of um, uh, art programs and so forth as being aspects of public safety. But the reality of it is, is that more, the more sustainable our community becomes, the safer and the stronger it will be. Right now, we have been, in a sense, uh, uh, served by an alien police force because of the fact that we ourselves have not been a strong community. And that's a decades-long problem that we've got to fix. And that's, that's the purpose of all this. The more we build that infrastructure, the more power, uh, the more strength we will have coming to the table uh, to say, here's how we want to do it from here on out. Thank you. That's my sense. Thank you. Deanna? I, I would just add that as we've been having conversations about community policing over the last few years, I think <clears throat> that both on campus and off, one of the things that's been interesting has been the, frame, the framework for that conversation around community policing. Um, we've looked at the seven mob, at the seven principles of community policing that were developed by COPS, the uh, yeah. Department of Justice. Yeah. And among those principles are things like language access, training, yeah. uh, transparency, yeah. uh, community engagement, uh, a, a whole host of them that I think really can help to guide the work of having that discussion and unpacking yeah. what should this actually look like, what should accountability actually look like across all of these different sectors of how the police are making their decisions and are actually executing them. And so I really encourage, uh, the, as a whole, Spencer and I have talked about it, and certainly with uh, Vice Sheriff's Office, there's been a lot of conversation about the police collaborative. So um, I know that the campus uh, groups have adopted that as the principles that they're building their work off of, and so I think it might be a great opportunity to, to build off of those as well. Yeah, my impression too is that Sheriff Brown's very, you know, willing to take input. I mean, compared to sheriffs, uh, I mean, I, as I say, I mean, he's, he's very present at events, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's a big county and he has a lot of responsibilities, mm -hmm. but I think that, that he's interested in it. One other issue on policing that I, I think also merits mention is that um, I've always been concerned that it seems to me, and I could be inaccurate on this, is that there's a, a disproportionate amount of policing resources and services that are provided like Monday through Friday, nine to five, you know, at times when it's kind of convenient for the people to be working rather than when the services are really needed so that it's not 
as much a question of the amount of services, but of how they're directed. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something that I think would be really interesting to find out information about. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. We'll definitely look into that. Anyone else? Um, I had, like, okay, I feel like one thing that might be helpful, like an additional service to provide, would be increased sanitation services. Because right now, Isla Vista kind of depends on Adopt-a-Block. And Adopt-a-Block receives funding from Goleta West Sanitary District, like on a yearly basis, that's not necessarily like, um, it's not permanent and it's not something that will necessarily continue. And I think that that is something that like, kind of on the subject of creating a sustainable community, getting people to care about it, when a community like is can be perceived in a way where it looks like people care, people will continue to care. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's um, kind of the reason I came here today was to see if um, there are plans to like help with that in particular, although it relates to a lot of other things. Um, but yeah, I feel like it doesn't, exactly fit with any of the services, but I think it would be something cool to think about. Okay. Well, it doesn't fit with the uh, current services. Um, it does fit with the CSD law. Um, there is a, um, a potential service that we could add for doing solid waste. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I, I know got brought up again for our visioning workshop um, that um, we, we can discuss it again. Cool. Um, that's so I don't know if you're available, or actually we, we should already announce that visioning yeah. workshop. since. Yeah, tomorrow afternoon um, there will be a board retreat, and for the first part of our, our retreat we're in training, um, but for the second part we're doing a board visioning and goals workshop for uh, the rest of the year, and also planning for kind of, so it's we're, we want to plan for the short run, working with the resources that we currently have, but then also in the long run, working with uh, <coughs> future resources, so that will be tomorrow's <coughs> thing. And then, yeah. From what, what time did you say? So it starts at 1 p.m. Does anyone know what time the the visioning will start? Um, I want to say it's at 5. I can two hours, check that. 5 o'clock, I think. It yeah. was because you have a lot of trainings to do in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I thought it was 1 to 3 was the sexual harassment training, and then starting at 3 was the... Well, we have to also, we're going to touch on Brown Act ethics. Oh, okay. Yeah. We should go over the agenda again. It's in our email. Yes. I can, I'll, I'll pull that up. Yeah. Yeah. So, so visioning is just for board. No, oh. forever. It's open to the public. Yeah. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Which is awesome. Where will be? Upstairs. It's actually <laughs> agendized for this oh. room, so it'll be there. You're not moving really it upstairs it anymore? It was agendized for the community okay. room. Yeah. So I guess it's in here. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Yeah. Is this going to be kind of the only visioning um, thing that you're doing for the rest of the year? No. Okay. But Good. <laughs> but definitely not. The next five that's years, that's the Yeah. 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 Wow. yeah. Um, with regard to the UUT, I think that this is a really great opportunity for all of us to kind of think about where we want the CSD to go. But I really want to hit on the aspect of bringing more people into the process itself. Um, I think that people can't really feel the impact of change as much as when they're involved in it and also feel that um, relationship with the community and really do want this to blossom. And I think that if more people um, were involved in the process, I think it would be a much more successful campaign in general. Um, so as part of that, I really want to make my mission bringing more people into this process, learn more about it. Cause it like as your PowerPoint made it seem so simple and tied a bow on top, but me trying yeah. to explain it to someone at their door after I just knocked on it, I'm like stumbling over my own words. And I really want people to understand it simply um, and be as committed to it as we are. So that's what my kind of goal out of all of this is, bringing more people in. And I think it's so bold. I'm sorry, I forget your, I forgot your name. Oh, Gordon. Gordon, thank yeah. you so much for coming, for wanting to get involved. Like that's so cool. And I want more people to do that. And I don't want these, meetings because everyone, I see so many familiar faces. I don't want this to be something that creates an insider-outsider kind of um, vibe. I want everyone to be able to come. So that's my goal today. And with that, I will also say that 
I appreciate the compliment on the PowerPoint, but this PowerPoint is the thing that I think a lot of us just hate about government. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and you know, it, it's something that we sort of have to do just as a boilerplate to make sure that we're hitting all the points and so that people can't come in and sort of poke their finger in our eye and say, well, why didn't you do that or why didn't you talk about this? Um, but we, we want to sort of strive to be a different kind of government in that sense, where we are sort of you know, opening ourselves up to the community and, and, and hearing what folks have to say in a more open process than just you know, us talking at you. So um, you know, with, with that, like I said, any sort of input that you have, any issues that you think exist in Isla Vista that um, you think that could be addressed, we'd love to hear them. Totally. And one more thing that I want to touch on real quick uh, is just really a spirit of efficiency that we've kept in mind as far as um, keeping our administrative costs as low as possible so that we can put the maximum amount of money um, towards services. Uh, we're probably the only special district board in the state of California that doesn't accept <laughs> money for our service <laughs> at this time. Um, so we're saving a lot of money there. Uh, we've been able to retain top-notch legal counsel at an extremely <coughs> discounted rate um, that has made it very um, very possible for us to continue to operate um, in, in a way that serves the public the best. We've been able to get high quality management um, for a very small stipend. Um, and everything that we've done it's kind of been to keep the administrative costs as low as possible. And going forward when we do have more revenue, we'll have to uh, Put, put more of it behind administration, but I still see us moving forward in a way that keeps administration lean so that we can really focus on getting as much money as possible to more public safety services, more community improvements. Mm -hmm. um, mm. I think that's that's been our operating spirit and will continue to be. Uh, one of um, my neighbors uh, from one of the hostile tribes <laughs> at the west <laughs> of our neighborhood um, said to me that this board was amateurs and I said well that's wonderful thank you very much because uh, amateur means someone who does it for love uh, not someone who does it for money someone who does it for money is a mercenary someone who does it for love is an amateur I am proud to be a member of an amateur board <laughs> I was going to just uh, follow up. I probably sound like a broken record for folks that know me, but in terms of the outreach um, and really supporting a really well thought out outreach for the you know kind of more marginalized members of the community, yeah. but also um, I met with Jonathan over the week, over the summer to talk about the um, translation of the IBCSD website, which I know isn't run by the IBCSD still, mm -hmm. but we went through it in a lot of detail about <coughs> kind of how we could support the translation um, of that. And I would love to see that um, move forward because it's you know trying to really take into account the lack of funding for it. Looking, you know, we looked at strategies to keep that um, very doable. So that's kind of low hanging fruit, at least for the website that's already there. Translation services, for me, are one of the top priorities in a yeah. way to bring in all members of the community. Yeah. Um, and I think it's it's a little bit unfortunate <coughs> we're unable to provide that at this time. But I think that that also in like a much larger community aspect and getting that off the ground. Um, but I, I definitely think that that's super important and very, very valid. And especially when we're talking about the UUT, this is absolutely going to affect everyone in the Vista's lives. So I think it's very important that everyone has access to the information. And we've also talked about ways to scale it, right? So I mean, during the AB3 meetings, there's a lot of discussion about if you can't fund a full interpreting and translation, then what are the ways to kind of do that, right? To yeah. do the website. And we went through and we identified like what are the evergreen pages of the website so they don't require changes. You know, it's a pretty shallow website in terms of there isn't tons and tons of content yet. So easy to translate it without a lot of upkeep to it. And then we talked about for the agendas, right? Being able to translate <coughs> those um, and the minutes, but then for anything that was more detailed, like reports, making an offer. Right, that it can be tra translated, you know, as needed. Um, so I think that there's lots of creative ways to think about how to scale that so that it begins to provide some of that for the community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, I I just wanted to follow up your comments on frugality, and I think that's a really important point to, to mention and emphasize because there will be a campaign against this proposal again in terms of the same forces that were against it last time are going to be against it this time. And they don't want to see an Isla Vista CSD existing into perpetuity. And their view is if they can defeat it, 
you know, several times that then it'll never it'll, it'll go out of existence. So my feeling is is that their biggest argument was it's all just going to go to staff salaries. It's all just going to be for a big bureaucracy, blah, blah, blah. In terms of that you really want to emphasize we're service oriented. These are the services we're providing. And, and I do want to say, too, that I, I think you would be wise to consider a rate less than 8% because I think that taxes are always something that people have a hard time voting for. I think an 8% utility users tax struck people as that's a lot, and particularly lower socioeconomic people, notwithstanding the potential for an exception. But I, I think that 6% would be better to go with, try to get it, make sure that the district is in place, and then go back in the future for another percent or two. But I, I think you have to look at it from a political standpoint as well. I think that along those lines, I don't know, I think that the percent and the 6% is obviously something to talk about. But I think that it's important too that this year we make sure, for me, 8% of my utilities is so abstract. And I need people to know what that is and be able to calculate that. Um, and that's something that I think that I really want to hammer on this year is I want you to be able to actually calculate it yourself. Like, I want it to be easy, I want it to be accessible, I want it to be online. You can type in how much your utilities cost and ta-da, that's how much it'll be a month. So it gives us some kind of understanding of the actual cost. Because 8% for me, like, it sounds like so much, you know, if you think about it. Then I'm like, uh, I consume this much electricity, I consume that much of this. So I think it'll be interesting. But also say um, that we ha did have, there was a very solid community message mm -hmm. um, last time, which is for the majority of Isla Vista residents, it's between 5 and $10 a mm -hmm. month, um, more so on the $5 side. Um, and also, I mean, I, as far as talking about those community groups that opposed it last time, I'm hopeful that maybe this time we can work more collaboratively and bring them into the fold because I think we do have a lot of, a lot of um, common interest and concern and hopefully passion for the community. But I'll also um, say that I don't think that it was opposed because of the, the amount of the rate. Um, I, I, it may have been that way, but I don't, I don't think that the property owners or any other opponents uh, were, were so opposed to that it was 8% and not 5 but And the, the, the one thing that was, once again, not enumerated at that time was, what are you going to get for it? You know, it was just, here's what you're going to pay. It wasn't, uh, here's what you're going to receive for that pay. Right. And, and I think once that list is populated, it makes a very different question. Absolutely. Uh, Jacob, then Mike. Yeah, kind of um, going off what Father John said that, um, and my my re recollection, a big struggle of it was, um, I don't know, a, I I feel like in some ways there hasn't been a clear articulation of what like we as a community can now do with with these services, that like having been part of the whole AB three process of hammering out like having these legal rights to to do stuff, like okay, great, we have this thing, but there hasn't been like a, a, a pretty clear vision of, of where we as a community go with this and what we can do with it. It's been kind of these, these individual services which, which can be really useful, but, but it's hard to um, take like an individual service and relate it to like, I don't know, a, a vision and a direction for a community. And in, in my eyes, that's the, the biggest thing that um, we're going to struggle with um, moving forward with this. <coughs> I just want to go back to um, the possibility of, of having a lower tax because, you know, when I would go door to door and talk to people about how much it would cost per person and say even like it would probably be about five dollars per person, most people were like, wow, that's a lot of money considering that they probably pay between, you know, thirty to forty dollars a month. Adding five dollars to that is like actually kind of a lot of money. So I think that there, that I agree with you that the people that were protesting this, it wasn't about how much it cost, it was about, it's, it was about having power over them. But I think that having a lower tax might be easier to just say, well, it's not even that much money, <coughs> as sort of an example. But I understand, obviously, there's a need for it to be you know, more, to be able to support the district. But it honestly might be easier to pass if it's less.
I think it's hard though too though moving forward if we were to let's say it's more palatable at a lower number now yeah. and then in a couple of years we realize look we still can't provide these services we still don't have the money and we say oh let's move it up to eight percent now we're the greedy easier. government yeah. now we're that greedy government who wants to take the rest of your money as opposed to saying this is what we need in so order to provide accurate service a prime appropriate services for the community. I think it would be easier to do it that way. You think it would? Yeah. I, although also, I mean, if you move it, so if, say you move it to 6%, I don't think we should get too bogged down in this. You know, then yeah. we're, we're moving the range from like, so the 5 to $10, it'll be like three fifty to $8. You know, that still seems kind of like the same, the same range. And then, yeah, then we are having to go back and go through this entire process and spend time with the board to go back and get 1 or 2%. I feel yeah. like that takes place over years and years. All it is is like a pack of gum, you know, in yeah. between 8% and 6% is like, yeah, it's a, it's a pack of gum. So I don't know, like, where that scale kind of lays. So, uh, Jay? I'm not sure if I'm, uh, I, I would actually advocate for the less than 8% tax, but the one, one comment I'll make is on that notion of trying to go back later and asking for more. Um, if you are able to show with a smaller amount of money that you can accomplish something great, mm -hmm. That's which is essentially what we're doing right now. Right, right. I mean, that's yeah. like the, the yeah. premise yeah. Of, right, the, of why we're even bothering to exist without yeah. having tax <laughs> is well, maybe if we can just get some grants and we can we can work with university, we can show that we can do great things, and then you'll you'll be willing to give us more money to do more great things. And and you can imagine a scenario where if we went and got a four percent tax, that later we could then say, oh, look what we did with a four percent tax. Imagine what we could do with an eight percent mm -hmm. tax. But I, I'm I'm still not certain I'm advocating for it because based upon the financial yeah. feasibility studies and everything, it's just okay. yeah. I, 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 I think it, it, it's it's a question that merits lots of discussion because it is the fundamental question, and to some extent it's, it's an empirical question. It's not a question what people want. It's a question of what would people vote for, and for what it's worth. Chuck Eckert strongly advocated before LAFCO for an 8% tax because he thought that would be the easiest to defeat in terms of, <laughs> I mean, you remember that, in terms of it is something that, and, and that I, my guess is be, would be what he will do again. So he'll say, yeah, go for an 8% tax because people here may not think that it's, it's, it makes a difference, but he thinks it makes a difference. I, I think that it's going to be, there isn't going to be $100,000 being spent on a yes on CS, IV, CSD initiative at the same time as it. And, um, you know, who's to say what the situation of the economy will be at that point in time? Um, you know, I, I think there, there ought to be a pol polling is, you know, the, the question. And it's, mm -hmm. it's something that, um, and it doesn't matter what the real cost is of 5 to $10. Dollars. I myself wrote in the independent, it was 5 to $10. It's not a question of what the analysis is. The opponents of it are going to say it's a five hundred dollar a year increase. It's sixty dollars a month. The point is, it's all going to be tossed around in terms of so that the higher the percentage is, it's something that um, eight percent's a lot. You know, I mean, the point is, it's a lot. It's a lot. I hate to admit it, but I've actually studied the uh, the psychology of uh, sales. Um, well, why do people make decisions? Why do they choose to buy one thing rather than to buy another thing? One thing that's very critical that comes out of that kind of research is that people don't buy just because of a list of features. They buy for a list of the benefits that they're personally going to get from it. You know, when we just talk in the abstract about, uh, you know, safety and so forth, it has to translate somehow to what that individual voter sees. And to get to that point, we have to ask the questions of them. What do you want? We need to listen to the people even more than we have so far. And when we listen to the people, when the people know we are listening to them, that's when they will vote to fund us. And uh, so that's why I hope we get this done. I think that was an excellent point. And I think, especially in our community, you know, a lot of us are, are really obsessing over the big picture right now, climate change, the economy, all of these things are really stressing <coughs> us out. So five to $10, that's too much for me. Um, if we take a look at the community choice energy kind of conversation that's been going on, how could we maybe adopt that for an Isla Vista kind yeah. of vision? How could we save our community money by working with yeah. landlords to bring yeah. more solar yeah. power to IV yeah. mm -hmm. and maybe charge them a small yeah. amount so they're getting something and it's an exciting larger vision mm -hmm. that we can maybe feed into as well. 
Mm-hmm. Well, and I will piggyback off by that, off of that by saying that while the committee is particularly focused on the UT, I'm sure I think all of us on the board have thought a lot about what the other ways that we can bring revenue into the district yeah. are that are irrespective of the UUT. And so that, that point is very much noted and appreciated. Michael and uh, <coughs> uh, a couple things. Um, um, I wanted to build off of uh, Jessica and Jacob's remarks on visioning. Um, I, I feel like the um, the way the survey is structured and the way that the CSD is structured based on the eight powers is a real constraint here. It, it, um, as Jacob was saying, it seems like um, th- there's this motley collection of specific powers, and it's hard to see a vision for how um, Isla Vista is going to become um, a more vital, more exciting, more inspiring place from that. And I don't have an easy answer for that, but somehow I think that if you can, if, if the CSD can couch the survey and couch all its I think sincere outreach efforts in a in a vision in in, in, a, in a process that solicits a larger vision, um, that would be really sweet. I, I really am inspired by uh, uh, the work that Jessica is undertaking with uh, uh, John her team and, and the John Horan's class. Um, I think they might um, be big players in this as well. Um, but but um, you know. It's hard. It's going to be hard for people to be grabbed by um, the individual points on the survey, and we need a, a way to make a more coherent vision of the Isla Vista that, that, that we want. And we want to draw people out for their vision. If, if people are drawn out in that way, then a lot of the specifics are going to be really obvious. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and one more thing that I'll add is, while I think the work of the Isla Vista Community Services District is very important and crucial for Ivy, we are a piece of the puzzle. And there's also beauty in that because it's a spirit of collaboration. We have the Isla Vista Recreation and Park District, we have associated students, we have the County of Santa Barbara. Um, and all of us working together as government and service providers to, to do what we can, but then also working with the business community and also working with the schools. And um, I think that's something we have to recognize in this too, that we, we do have these eight services and these eight powers that the voters and constituents of Isla Vista presented <coughs> and pushed for and achieved, but um, we are not the, the panacea for everything Isla Vista. We're, we're happy to do all that we can and, and push to do more, but um, we are working with a lot of stakeholders for that, uh, that broader, broader vision. Um, one, I feel like this might be repetitive of what everyone else has been saying, but I feel like people are really gravitated to things where they feel like there's a connection to their identity as part of it. And I think that like, like listing the particular services provided, like it is, it's like the first step, but I also think to get it to be more of a hook and something that people like care about and feel excited about and like want to engage with, it also has to be something that they can like relate to, which um, it it's interesting because y'all are trying to like do particular services, but that also goes into like marketing it a type of way. Um, but I think that in order to do one, you kind of have to do the other, and I don't know how, but I think it is an important thing to consider. So <coughs> And this is kind of, I don't know, different than a lot of the, uh, that I think one of the, the best uses of, of this money would really be more administration. That, that sounds kind of odd, but I don't know. If, if we could then, like, as a community, be funding more people to, like, after they graduate, stick around being full-time, act like, activists in organizing stuff, most of the actual money for the services that we want to do stuff is going to need to come from grants anyway. Yeah. That the, like the, the amount of money this is talking about isn't going to be able to solve all the issues of lighting or, or other things. It, it can help, but um, 
I, I'd kind of, on, on some level, rather see a couple of recent grads sticking around, working full time on Isla Vista issues, much, much like Deanna. Um, that it, like, I, I think that would, having three more Deannas would be one of the best bangs for our buck <laughs> we would possibly have. Wow. Um, <laughs> we would have to do it. <laughs> and that it, it could also Definitely then be problems. starting to get at one of the big problems with Isla Vista and why so many things can be slow, so slow to happen is that um, we are a very transient community and it's hard to get people to stick around at, after graduating and that this institution could be part of the means by which we get even just a, a handful of people sticking around more um, that it, it would slow the, the loss of, of kind of institutional knowledge that gets built up and dissipated mm -hmm. so consistently. And that, um, I don't know, I, I just, I, I see a lot of these services as, as very Im important and needed, but but very slow to be coming to fruition, um, largely because of, of money and that it also then leaving people with a lack of a clear vision for it. And I, I see a lot more through a municipal advisory council and, and having I don't know, more staff and um, people whose job it is to be organizing around Isla Vista issues. Um, that's, that's kind of my vision for, for the district. Just to follow directly up on that, has there been more discussion about the grant writer position and, and any thoughts about funding that or, or well, that's still kind of somewhere in the radar? radar? Um, yes, so that's right now part of Jonathan's duty. Um, and Jonathan has gotten us all of the grants that we've received so far, so 23000 on that front, not counting the money we've received from the supervisor's office or money for our office space. But, um, but going forward, I mean, when we can <coughs> increase that position, when we can increase the general manager, who is not just responsible for administration, but also ser overseeing services and uh, working on community programming, um, that, that will have more resources to uh, go after grants as well. And I just want to say I appreciate your comments on that because administration isn't sexy by any means and um, not always the most fun thing to say that you think money should go towards. But I think it's worth noting, especially because um, our organization right now as you know, one staff member is sort of like a baby in a sense. And um, in order for that to grow and to sort of be able to grow into adulthood, it's going to need to become uh, an organization that has uh, more dedicated staff to it that are working more hours that are doing those things and then once we're able to to show that we have all that sort of administrative stuff down then we have such a better argument to do some of the things that i was talking about earlier one of the uh, original things that was interesting about the csd's powers which was the ability to take over various contracts that exist already at county government and bring them closer to the people here in isla vista so that the people here will have the leverage over those things, whether it's policing, whether it's, I know one of the things Director Freeman has talked about in the past is uh, trash and sanitation. Um, we, we, right now, if we want to see changes in that, got to go and you know talk to our county supervisor and the sheriff or whoever it is that's in charge of it, whichever department has the county is in charge of it, and hope that they like our idea and that they'll you know hear it out enough to actually make some change happen. But if we were the ones that were holding the strings on a contract like that, then we would have the true power over it. And in order to get to that place, we are going to need more staff. So, um, yeah, that's my two cents. So, and I think this has been a great discussion as yeah. far as kind of kicking off um, the outreach process for um, really finding out what the community <coughs> desires are and how they've changed and progressed since we initially uh, developed this structure for funding and ultimately what we'll want to pursue uh, to provide the best service that we can. Um, so are there any other comments or questions before we, we do it, Jer? Um, sorry, I was just taking in everyone's no comments. Um, I think a huge thing that would help the CSD is to establish its continuity and like its publicity and how it's known from students especially is um, 
a huge thing is a lot of my friends were transferring and they were asking me, should I go to Berkeley or UCSB? And they were thinking Berkeley because a lot of my friends are poli sci like people because it has the reputation of being a very political campus. And I told them no. Like UCSB is where students actually have a hand in every mm -hmm. single aspect of like government Sorry, establishing the CSD came out of like as members of Associated Students. And I was um, talking with Hugh briefly just now about how some students don't see themselves as Islandists. And the people involved in this are people that see themselves as like Islandists and like feel that community. And then you have like um, the uh, older members of community, business owners, um, children, and like there's this huge divide. And I think having like guest lecture um, in at UCSB would be a huge thing because then poli sci students will see like I'm not only at a university that like I'm learning at, I'm at a university where I can apply everything I'm learning like right outside my door. And like I can be a part of that, so that would establish the continu continuity. And if the university were to advertise Isla Vista as a place where um, students establish like government here, like that's a huge thing too. Like not just that we're this beautiful beach town, we're this beautiful project of people creating like government and figuring out everything and students collaborating with like every aspect of the community. So I think that with like the charge of 8%, thinking back to other comments, um, students are a huge part of this population and so they would be paying for a lot of it. And like it's not necessarily the number, it's how they feel about it. And some people are just like, I just don't know what this is going towards. So like, just like, it's a lot of moving pieces, but I think that really bringing students into the fold and having them feel that same passion that other people who've been here for a while <coughs> is super important. Mm -hmm. Seeing the CSD as like an aspect of like student action. Great point, thank you. <coughs> Hugh? Yeah, I'd like to kind of echo some of what Kristen said already in that um, students, this, this, this concept that we talk about in terms of Isla Vista community does not resonate with students whatsoever. The students simply don't see themselves as Isla Vistans, and see, they see themselves as students who just happen to live in Isla Vista, which is a different concept, especially when you're promoting this um, utility tax moving forward. It's something that's centered around Isla Vistans. I think um, having something that really resonates with students moving forward, as what Kristen alluded to, would be really helpful. Um, so yeah. Thanks, Father John. I've often said that there are dissertations waiting to be written on the experiences that we're having here right now. And uh, uh, Isla Vista for decades has been a, a, a place, a social laboratory in many ways. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's underwritten on, you know, when you go through the literature. And uh, I think that notion needs to be floated in those departments that are relevant, uh, poli-sci, anthropology, sociology, and so forth. Um, art, for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this is a community where th this, there's ferment here. This is a lively place. This is a place worth staying in. I am glad I stayed in Isla Vista after I came here in the mid-60s. I'm glad I stayed here. I'm glad I raised my family here. I am an Orthodox priest. There's no, there's no scandal involved. I want to make that very clear. <laughs> but I, we did raise our family here, and, uh, and our, our, our son graduated from here, as I did, and we had a granddaughter that almost went here, but ended up going to Westmont, because she got a better scholarship there. But um, uh, there are things to make a life of uh, in this place. This isn't just party central. This is a place to build a life. I'm wondering if you all have thoughts about what is some of the ways in which it resonates that that perspective about IV be, you know, being or not being on the distance that that would resonate more for students. Any thoughts? So a lot of the students. Oh, sorry. No, no. Go ahead. I a lot of students don't even know the history of activism. Like yeah. the bank yeah. running yeah. down is a huge yeah. thing. Yeah. Like the National Guard was called in. There was like a bunch of stuff that happened in Peoples yeah. Park. I read a history book about it for UCLA, so that's why I know about it. And I was just shocked, and I and it got me so excited. And mm. then the concept of the CSD was literally like former AS positions decided to get together and like work with people and write this bill, and now it's here. That's like huge for me because. Mm seeing that as a student in my time here, that like not only am I gonna be participating in programs, like I can create like 
change, like tangible change within the four years that I'm here. So that's something that really resonates with me and that I tell people who want to come to UCSB is that if you're interested in politics, you will have a huge hand in politics. You won't just be witness to it. Mm -hmm. and I guess adding on to that, um, everything that was listed on there resonates with students. All the services are being provided. It's how you tie that to the student educational experience mm -hmm. as promoting that. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> if I just see that, you know, when I'm looking at that as you know, part of the Islamistic community experience, it resonates a lot differently because it's something that's for older people, adults, you know, that have to worry about the you know sewage or public safety mm -hmm. or you know utility, you know, a utilities act, just for an example, this is not something that really hones in. If you tie that to like the student educational experience, such as like you know, parking makes it easier for you to get to your classes, et cetera, et cetera, or, you know, stuff like that, so. But Shiva, as someone who really is that tie between the students and the community within your position, what do you think could be a way to, like, brand these, um, these services directly to the students? Well, I mean, I agree with what was said earlier, where at the end of the day, students want to know how it's going to benefit their daily lives. They want to know how their daily lives are going to get better, not just throughout the year, but like today, this is what's going to happen because of the CSD. And I think that listing the services on the ta on the ballot isn't necessarily going to do anything because nobody knows what a municipal advisory committee is. But if you can list something that it will do for students daily, I think that would be extremely mm -hmm. beneficial. And then the students would see the benefit in having a CSD because, you know, most students don't know what the CSD is, and students that do don't necessarily know why we even need it. And I think that by clarifying how their lives will get that much better would actually you know, improve the way we see voter patterns, and people would actually like the CSD. And, you know. Right. And real quick, we should also clarify that um, while we're going over the, the legal definitions of services here, um, our outreach and what really got 87% of the voters of Isla Vista to call for a CSD was exactly what we're talking mm -hmm. about here, yeah. talking about how it'll make the everyday lives of Isla Vista <coughs> better so that our friends yeah. aren't having unjust battles with their landlords, so that family members of ours don't get assaulted in the streets of Isla Vista, so, so that we have, your own block. yeah, so that we have more cultural programming. And mm -hmm. I think that relatable, um, message will be the same, uh, I mean, the, the same primary focus. Obviously, we've evolved as a community in terms of, of needs, but top priority of relating to people. Um, yeah. I think Just one thing that could be rallied more effectively in this campaign is the concept of identity. I'm actually in an interest group class right now. Like, one thing we're learning is, like, how identity fuels action through, like, values and emotions that people feel. And that's one thing that I feel Isla Vista has so much of is this concept of, oh, I live in IV, I love IV. Mm -hmm. It's because we're so unique compared to any other college campus in California or even the nation. Um, and I feel like that's one thing a lot of students take a huge amount of pride in. So this concept of Isla Vista, I think that should be pushed a lot because people feel a strong identity and connection with that. Um, especially just me and the people I know, like, or people I talk to around. Like, I love taking pride that I live in IV and I go to UCSB and I'm mm -hmm. a Galcho. And I feel like that's something that could be fueled in the campaign for this utility tax coming up in June, hopefully. Um, that could be much more pushed to unite, like, a common identity community to back it. I just wanted to speak to um, connecting stu students to the history of Vital Vista through their educational experience. Um, so this summer, I actually um, helped to teach with John Foran in his class. It was what's wrong with the world and how do we fix it? And we made it an Isla Vista focused project. And we also did another project in spring quarter um, called the world in, and it, the class was called the world in 2050. And we did another project called Isla Vista in 2050. So I have a flash drive with a bunch of student projects that we've been analyzing. And um, I was actually taking students out in different clusters into IV to go visit the Isla Vista Community Bike Shop, um, visit the community gardens, and talk about this very radical, amazing history that IV has. And that changed a lot of students' perspectives because we started off by saying, so what do you think of when you think of IV? They're like, parties, cool new people, trash, um, noise, and <coughs> not that great food. Like, those kinds of negative things are mixed in with really positive, like, elements of community, of freedom, of exploration and innovation. So mm -hmm. I, I think, like, really embedding this into 
like certain classroom experiences is really important moving forward and I'm more than happy to share the wealth of perspectives and information that I've been mining so yeah. so, so actually in the spring um, the EVPLA position teaches a class on Isla Vista um, and I think that there's some issues with you know, it happening this year with the policy department. So I'm trying to sort of just revive the class and tr sort of get a whole new approach to it and kind of change it a bit to in order for it to kind of continue. So I'd love to talk with yeah. you. Yeah. I'd love to talk to you about your history that you've been working mm -hmm. on. Um, <coughs> an idea I've had for a little while that I feel like connects with, with really a lot of what we're talking about here is I would really love to see sometime in spring a, um, a festival or really like a street party where we block off Del Playa. We have lights and amplified music and places where people can, can legally drink. And then we also have kind of, I don't know, like stands and information and art that's talking about all of this stuff, that's explaining some of the things that the CSD is, is, is trying, and other institutions in IV are trying to do that like you come out because it's fun and it's the best party that's happening in IV that night and it just has all of this stuff that has you begin the conversation of, of what we're, we're doing, gives you access to how you can get more, more involved with things that you can you connect with and um, I don't know, I, I don't, I don't want to see it as like another event that the people that are organizing it show up to and bring some of their friends like yeah. in, in People's <laughs> Park. Um, like those, those are great. We've had a lot of those, but um, like I, I really think also kind of shutting down the street would also be this projection of this power that we have um, as a community and that trying to build that up um, is really integral to, to all of this. It's like we, we need to have a discussion of not just what do we want or what are our needs or what interests students, but what power do we have and how can we build that up? It seems like one of the themes that goes around a lot is this opportunity that we have, right? That we are asset rich community, right? We have so many resources, so much work that's gone in. That question of uh, how do we transfer that, right? And pass it over and, and make it long. I think, I imagine, Jacob, one of the reasons why the MAC is so interesting to you is because it provides that, that moment and that opportunity to address these overarching issues, right? That don't have one space necessarily in a power. It's more about maximizing collaborations and maximizing opportunities for the work to happen. So I want to just put it out there, and I don't know that it belongs within the CSD, but I think that this idea that I've heard from the time I've got here, I've thought about it a lot uh, around this idea of a center for community engagement, yeah. right? that would really be able to hold all the different projects that are happening, the amazing work that's going on, and allow people to pull from it. You know, allow the community to be nourished by more faculty, you know, visiting lecturers, those kinds of things. Then also allow a place for students to do their projects, to understand where that information is coming from, carry those forward, find ways in which we're not having 10,000 different events that are, you know, are or not well attended, but, you know, being able to combine that and make it more effective and maximizing the money that we're investing in the community. And so just a thought about other ways that I think all of these disparate pieces of work that we're doing need to be connected and, and however the CSD can be part of that, I think would be such a great benefit because we are so asset rich already. We just have to tie it together more. Mm -hmm. Michael? I'd like to speak to uh, Jacob's remark. Um, I think we would really benefit by taking a page from the city repair project in Portland. And when we have block parties, leave something concrete leave something beautiful behind that people can point to and say, you know, hey, we helped build that. You know, that, that's a part of our community that we're going to safeguard. We're, you know, we're going to make sure, you know, that doesn't get tagged. You know, we're going to make sure that that gets built on. Maybe more functions get built around that. I couldn't agree more. We've got like little handprint painting. Um, and me and all my housemates like made a priority to go out there and put our hands on it. And my family came to visit. The first thing that I wanted to show them for some reason was like my handprint on this wall, which is like, you know, you think about it, it's literally just a paint on my fingers. But like it, it really made me feel a sense of community. And I think that that's really important, especially when we're talking about one of the services as graffiti abatement and how public, beautiful art pieces can um, can avoid that kind of defacement. Mm -hmm. I also think that in 
IV and like just with it being a college town there's a huge lack of institutional memory and like mm -hmm. pretty much every organization I've been a part of so I feel like I'm assuming people probably keep repeating mistakes and it's something that like I've been trying to think of a solution to. I don't really know if there's one but I think that like overall community engagement like being able to physically see the history through things like art and being like oh wow they did that in this date and like at Kajde they have that picture of the bank burning like things like that kind of build curiosity and like pride in where you are. Hmm. I could not agree more with that comment. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm sure I see Deanna smiling as well. <laughs> I always hmm. see Deanna. <laughs> yeah. And I very actively like that Center for Community Engagement is such an active way of, I love that. of so doing cool. that. It's right there. I think another big part of it too, when we're talking about, we talk a lot about communities and we talk about like specific areas of the communities, such as like the houseless community or like specific marginalized communities or families within our, um, within Isla Vista. But I think something that we really can't forget is that each of these groups are made up of individuals that have individual preferences and individual um, thoughts and objectives. So, so I think that a big part of this too, as much as I want to do outreach to communities, I want to keep in mind that like the voice of maybe one part of that community does not represent everyone. So I really want to try and keep that in mind moving forward and make sure that we're trying to cover all of our bases and speaking. I'm, I really want to speak to everybody in IV, but I don't think that's possible. But I can change <laughs> I just want to say one other thought about um, what Kristen was saying about, uh, both of you, about applied um, education in the community. There's a Carnegie uh, designation, um, you know, that they use for the best colleges. One of those designations is a is an elected designation for community engagement. And there's an organization, a national organization called Campus, Campus Compact. They have state level um, chapters as well. And, and part of what they do, so their whole thing is having you engage you know, how do you do community engagement work? And one thread of what they do is prepare universities and communities to, be, to, to gain that designation. So it's a very like um, evaluation and, and uh, assessment based program, but it would be something to consider that if the university had all of a sudden this designation that it is a leader in the nation around community engagement and all what that means, I think it would be a really interesting way to also make this be a place that attracts students who are thinking about that kind of a, of a relationship. Sorry, I'm late, no, but just to follow up on that, the, just so you know, the university actually used to be members of uh, uh, California Campus Compact, uh, and it's a designation that goes to the Chancellor's Office, and so there, we have some documentation on that, and that would actually be a good opportunity now to kind of bring that back and invite the campus to particularly with the realities going on in Iowa Vista to yeah. bring membership. Yeah. 11,000 a year. Just check it out. California Campus Combat. 11,000. For a membership, yeah. The uh, national website, the Campus Compact General one, has great information. Really, really resource rich around community engagement. And the conference is coming up in March, by the way. I was kind of curious to know um, how, so we've talked a lot about student outreach. I was kind of wondering about the rest of Isla Vista outreach and like how y'all have been doing that, how it's been going. Yeah, so um, every month we're at the Isla Vista Community Network Meeting, which is a round table of primarily service providers, local nonprofits, and then government agencies. And within that, there's the Isla Vista Youth Projects and the Isla Vista Teen Center, which we've maintained a, a positive working relationship with um, with both organizations and we've been in contact with their um, with, with their respective leadership. I would say that's one of the primary ways that we've communicated with with all members of the community. Um, additionally, um, I've had different um, spoken at different neighborhood meetings on the west end of Isla Vista with a lot of the more long term property owners. So um, I think kind of the, the groups other than Students are primarily long-term property owners, and then uh, primarily, primarily the Latino families. And I think that the Olive Youth Projects and the Teen Center have been how we've been outreaching to them. But I think we definitely need to do more. What about the community outreach committee? Do you want to speak on yeah. that, Brother John and Jay? Um, I'm sorry, as I was, did you get that? We have um, definitely. Uh, uh, 
through our interns, we have reached out over into the Latino community, uh, um, and I think that's an area that there needs to be a lot more robust outreach. Um, uh, but as to the West End, um, you know, I, I can just report back there are a couple converts over there uh, that, that, that really have begun to see the CSD in a, in a more positive light. So, uh, and I, I, I think the more we prove ourselves, the more that will get some traction. Um, the folks on the street, um, uh, our houseless population, uh, you know, we definitely, uh, um, we, we want everyone in the community to have a voice here. And um, uh, I, I, I can report back that some of them look at this with great hope. Some of them have expressed great hope about what we're doing here, that this will be a more compassionate community, a more safe community. <coughs> what we spend a lot of time doing in the community engagement committee is essentially brainstorming about all the different um, subgroups um, to the extent to which we even feel comfortable talking about subgroups. And yeah, yeah, yeah. A discussion of balkanization. Right, <laughs> um, right, right. And, and trying to figure out um, paths by which we could um, uh, outreach each of those different groups, um, looking at um, particular specific people who might be good opportunities or looking at strategies um, that we could use in order to do that. Uh, and so it's something that um, we've got now many pages of notes that I think we're just compiling together into a report document to bring back to the board. That's awesome. The whole balkanization thing, I, I, I have a, an often stated position that they're, they're not populations, they're persons. And really, really, that's been half of our problem in community building is that we, we, we turn everybody into a, pop, a, a balkanized population, and then we deal with them like they're a sort of monolithic. You know, we come up with a strategy to reach them, rather than one on one. And uh, you know, our, our best work gets done human to human. And then one more thing I'll add is, I mean. I feel like local government all around the country is kind of an obscure thing for people and communities. Um, and I think that we constantly want to try to make it as straightforward as possible and as understandable as possible. But at the same time, um, as far as measuring success, I think I care more about if someone knows that they can now access uh, community service officers late at night on the street. Yeah, yeah, if someone yeah. knows that um, in this room that we operate, during the week that we have the family literacy program two nights yeah. a week and that yeah. we have Thrive Isla Vista here once a week doing uh, programming for parents. Um, if people know that when we roll out our tenant mediation program uh, that they can now uh, access this new service. Whether people know or not um, that it's the CSD which is governed by seven officials making these decisions, um, I think that's helpful to know and that can help people become more engaged. But but ultimately, um, I, I, I'm much more concerned about the, the service provision and people uh, seeing that different set of things. Yeah, I think this has been a really cool meeting. Um, later on today, there's the Isle of Vista Fall Festival, so please be sure to check that out. And then um, on the 28th, which is our next regular board meeting, we'll be having a tenant's uh, tenant mediation service discussion, um, town hall type. Um, additionally, Associated Students is hosting a tenant landlord town hall in this room this week on Tuesday night at 6 o'clock. Yeah, at 6 p.m. And that's more centered around interrelations in terms of communication, would you say? How would you best describe that? Um, well, I would say that um, it, there have been um, obviously very serious concerns around some of the relationships with the property owners in IDE. Um, I know most recently we had an instance, of course, that Evening was, um, was uh, uh, unfortunately uh, 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 subjected to. And so we've already had some um, uh, workshops around how to deal with issues such as entering property, because that's been one of the ongoing concerns around particular properties. And so this, uh, this um, town hall builds on those experiences and just kind of speaks broadly about what are, the, what are tenants feeling in terms of their interactions with, the, with their uh, property owners? So both kind of a conversation about it and also some opportunities to know more about your rights and protections as tenants. Anything to add, Kian? I know you were the author of that resolution. No, I just glad that the community is coming together and staying together. And um, I hope that some good comes out of this town hall and situations like this never happen again. 
Well, with that, uh, we want to thank everybody for coming. Um, we went around, and I think we got everyone's um, name and contact information and uh, uh, whether or not they wanted to be involved. And as I'm looking at this, I see a lot of yeses. So um, that's a, a really good sign for the community yeah. going forward. Um, for those of us on the ad hoc committee, if you have any particular questions about um, things that are really in the weeds with this, we'd love to talk to you um, just one-on-one. -on -one. Um, always feel free to approach us and um, you know ask us whatever it is uh, that you want or bounce ideas off of us. So with that, um, thank you all for coming. Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. <laughs> Do you have a motion? Oh, I'd okay. like to motion to adjourn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Also, <laughs> okay, let's uh, record that. So, motion to adjourn at 1 55, made by Jordan, seconded by Grant. Any public comment? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So ordered. We're adjourned at 1 55. All right. Good job, guys. Have fun. Good job. Good job.